Well, welcome for a few latecomers. Um, that was quite handy to have that little video um, on there. Hi, do come in. Um, let me just the next one. Oh, there we go. So, um, as I said, we have a panel uh, that's going to talk through some of these issues um, in the report that I, that I mentioned. Um, but before then, we have uh, someone who needs little uh, for me to introduce, and that is uh, the one of the architects of the uh, 2015 Paris Climate Deal, now the convener of uh, Mission Innovation, Christiana Figueres, who's going to be talking uh, for a few minutes at the start. Christiana. Um, so let me, um, let me start with two sets of thank yous. Um, the first definitely goes to Imperial and the Grantham Institute uh, for for having collaborated on this fantastic report and for this event um, together with uh, Carbon Tracker. And for those of you who don't know, Carbon Tracker has just won a very impressive prize uh, from uh, Business Green as the best NGO. Uh, and uh, I should say that um, both the Grantham Institute and Carbon Tracker are two of the reasons why I chose to move to London. I moved here in December. Um, and I did a very scientific inventory of where are, where is the greatest concentration of climate brains in the world, because I could have lived wherever I wanted after leaving the UN. And hands down, London is the highest concentration of brains on climate, um, many of them concentrated here at Grant Grantham and, uh, and Carbon Tracker. So thank you uh, for bringing me to London. Um, and my second set of thanks goes to Mr. Donald Trump. Uh, I honestly, I am truly great, but sincerely, I don't even mean it facetiously, facetiously, right? Uh, I have just never seen one person single-handedly shore up as much, uh, as much resolve in every country as Donald Trump has done on action on climate change. I mean, it is a real achievement, right? One person actually cementing the, uh, the determination of change among so many different stakeholders, both inside the United States and outside. So thanks uh, to him for helping us into the new phase of the, uh, of the implementation of the Paris Agreement. However, just for the record, to get it very, very straight, from a legal and political point of view, the Paris Agreement is non-negotiable, period. New paragraph, we don't even have to discuss it. There is just no, uh, no discussion on that one, and I think that has been abundant, made abundantly clear by quite a few heads of state around the world. And the second is, from an economic point of view, the decarbonization of the global economy is irreversible. There is also no discussion about that. We can discuss, and we will discuss today, the speed and scale of this, but the direction is irreversible. Uh, and uh, so, no, you know, even, even White House announcements are not going to change that. Um, that does not mean that we're on track yet. And the yet is perhaps the important part to that sentence. So let me just start by saying, you know, where are we uh, with respect to the decarbonization that is envisioned in the Paris Agreement, not just with the first collection of uh, national uh, contributions, but actually throughout the Paris Agreement, because you will know that the Paris Agreement foresees several rounds of increased ambition every five years. So where are we with respect to that? The first piece that I would like to um, emphasize is the very clear movement that we have had over the past 12 months, but you can go back farther, uh, with the work of the, uh, of the task force on financial disclosure, where today, yes, today, it's being uh, presented officially to the Sherpas of, uh, of the uh, G20, and will then go for discussion among them for some decision on the part of, uh, of the G20. Really very important work on financial disclosure of the risk of exposure to, uh, to uh, noxious uh, carbon, uh, carbon assets. Um, and, and in fact, already being clearly taken up the fear of that risk most recently by the shareholder resolution in ExxonMobil, as well as in Occidental, where the shareholder resolution was incontrovertibly that they do have to begin to share the information on their risk. And those are the last two that have come on board with respect to shareholder resolutions. But we thought ExxonMobil 
you know, that would never happen among the shareholders, and it has. So very clearly a movement forward on the interest and the need for disclosure, um, and already some of the financial institutions, such as HSBC, saying, you know what, maybe that disclosure shouldn't be voluntary, maybe it should be obligatory. Not where the world is yet, but certainly some leading financial institutions are beginning to see that that may become necessary in the, uh, in the near future. So on disclosure, which is the first, uh, the first step, we're definitely walking in the second direction, in the right direction. On the second step, which is decarbonization itself, there again, we're walking in the, um, in the right direction. Um, despite the fact that we have now a growing uh, gap or growing dissonance between the real economy and the unreal politics, uh, and that gap may increase over the next few years, but despite that, you have, as you well know, an incredible upswell of uh, support for decarbonization, certainly within the United States, remains to be seen whether without the support of the federal government, that upswell is going to be enough to meet the 26 to 28 uh, percent cut that the United States was, uh, had committed itself to. That remains to be seen, and there are arguments on both sides. But in any event, even if they were not to make it, and there are many who argue that they will, they will be uh, pretty close to that. Um, and I'm sure that you have all read the, um, the announcements from China closing over 100 uh, coal plants due to both <coughs> air quality as well as excess capacity, a very important uh, factor. Um, and then, of course, China's, uh, China's commitment to EVs that goes beyond anything uh, around the world, India not lagging behind saying, you know what, under Paris we said we would be at 40% renewable energy by 2030, but because solar is so much cheaper than coal in <laughs> India, now we know that we can go to 60% renewable energy in our grid, and not by 2030, but by 2027, three years earlier. So very much uh, denoting the exponential growth of the potential of renewables. Um, and then, of course, all of you, I'm sure, read the fantastic news from Volvo today that as of 2019, all of their uh, cars will not be relying on uh, the internal combustion engine. Um, and that, and the same article points out that by 220, uh, electric vehicles or, or hybrids will have a range of 500 uh, kilometers. So already a very, very interesting uh, step forward toward a tipping point that is presented in this, uh, in this report that AJ will present to you, the 10% tipping point. Once you have that market share tipping over, then, uh, then you have a, almost a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, in the industry, and uh, we're getting pretty close to that on transportation. We're already beyond that in renewables. Um, and finally, then, the question is on green bonds, or rather on finance of, of all of the above. Where are we? Well, again, their exponential growth. We've gone from 10 to 40 to 80 last year. And the current two predictions that we have for this year are um, the new uh, climate uh, economy report, no, the new energy finance report. Uh, Michael Liebreich is estimating over 120 billion for this year, Moody's estimates 200 billion. So, you know, maybe somewhere in between the two, but clearly way beyond uh, and more than 100% growth from where we were last year, uh, with some sovereigns actually having already issued bonds such as China, Poland, France, Nigeria, um, and many of the international financial institutions, the World Bank, the European Investment Bank having, ha having issued, and then even uh, subnational governments such as the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the city of Joburg, just to name a few. So the, the instrument already becoming actually quite, uh, quite a popular instrument uh, and being used for many different purposes. So does that mean that we actually are where we need to be? No, clearly no. Where do we need to get to? From our perspective, we need to bend the curve uh, of emissions by 2020, which is just 3.5 years from now. That may seem impossible, but uh, I love impossible missions, and I work with everybody to make the impossible possible. Um, and the fact is that if you look at this, we have a math challenge and we have a timing challenge. The math challenge is that we have to stay within the carbon budget. We have to stay to make things simple. 
within a 600 gigaton budget um, that we have and currently burning at 40 gigatons a year, uh, we basically have 15 years in the best of all cases to go from where we are to zero. And we know that you don't decarbonize the economy going from 40 to zero overnight. So we have to reserve some time and we have to reserve some carbon uh, emissions to be able to transition the economy. And that smooth transition of the economy is the really tricky challenge here because it cannot be so slow that we go beyond the budget and it cannot be so uh, so fast that we actually put the global economy into a stress point or what Matt Carney calls the jump to distress. So it is that that uh, combination between the volume or the math and the timing that is uh, the very tricky piece that uh, many people are working on because we must remain within a prudent trajectory of emissions. Anything beyond that would get us into a situation where we would certainly close the door to two degrees, uh, to 1.5 degrees for sure. We may very, very uh, clearly, uh, very likely close the door to two degrees as temperature increase, and we would certainly um, uh, endanger the likelihood that we ever may be able to achieve the SDGs by 2030 due to the hits to infrastructure around the world. So what is the gap? Where, where, where are we between where we are now and where we have to be? And I'll just talk about two of the sectors, although there are many others. The first, of course, renewable energy. It's car, uh, at the heart of the discussion today. We know that we're at 23.7% of renewable energy in the, in the energy grid, and the IEA is projecting that we'll be somewhere between 26 and 27%. Well, the IEA is consistently having to revise its projections up because, of course, the nature of the institution forces them to be very conservative. So there is not that much of a gap between the 26, 27 that they're predicting and the 30 percent, which is where we have to be at 2020, um, in addition to the fact that we have to be at the point where no new coal is being approved as of 2020. No more new coal. And on transportation, um, and uh, Aj Ajay will uh, address uh, quite a few of the uh, exciting examples that are coming on board in renewable energy and in transportation, but just to give you the gap, the transportation, we actually do have a broader gap. We're currently at 1% market penetration of EVs, and we have to be at approximately 15% of market penetration by 2020, which means that uh, the exponential curve in transportation really needs to help us out here uh, to get to 15% of new sales being uh, clean, clean vehicles. Uh, that doesn't mean uh, that those two sectors, which are definitely the ones that are uh, the winning in, in, the, in the race here to 2020, just because we get those two doesn't mean that we would be able to bend the curve by 2020, but those are definitely the ones that are uh, fastest moving. I am particularly concerned about land use, about infrastructure, um, and about heavy industry that are not uh, currently showing the pace of uh, change uh, of the others. Um, and finally, on, on finance, we have to be at a trillion uh, a year by 2020. We're currently at 300. But there are some predictions that we may be at a trillion dollars just with green bonds by 2020, which, if we are able to do that, uh, would get us uh, really pretty, pretty well to where we need to be. So the gap, to be very frank uh, with you, the gap is sizable in some sectors more than others, but it is not impossible. It is definitely not impossible. We believe that with intentionality, with in, in unleashing ingenuity, and above all, making full use of the exponential nature of technology uh, of technology advance is how we're actually going to get to where we need to get. We have known for about uh, a decade that the decarbonization of the global economy was irreversible, I mean, still is irreversible. Uh, but what the new message that is coming out now, and I think the core of the message that we all would like to share with you today, is that actually the exponential nature of change is now unavoidable. And that is a very new message that is coming out of the analysis that uh, will be shared today, but also many others around the world. So thank you for that.
Now, I'm um, just going to introduce to you the chair of the panel discussion, and that is uh, James Deaton, who's the research director of our partners, the Carbon Track Initiative. James, over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Martin. Uh, that was a great introduction from, from Christiana there. A quick scan across all the, the technology, the policy, and the, the finance that we're, we're seeing. And that was part of the reason we, uh, we work with Imperial uh, on this uh, analysis. Um, it's, uh, it's great that they've let us back in the door after we spent, myself and my colleague Luke, most of last year trying to deconstruct AJ and his colleague Tamarin's model, and then they spent the rest of the year trying to put it back together. Um, but we're still talking, so that's good. For um, a much better version. Because it's yeah. uh, an ev evolution, I think, of the, uh, think so. yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, this came from our sort of intrigue as to, you know, how, how to challenge some of the assumptions in energy models, how to update the thinking and make sure we're reflecting, you know, the latest costs uh, in modelling. Um, so, yeah, I'll hand over to uh, AJ to take you through the work. Okay, thanks very much, James. Slides are working. So, over the next 10 minutes or so, I'll give you a uh, very brief overview of the uh, report. I hope you'll all have a chance to uh, read this in in some detail, but uh, if you're uh, keen to know what the key messages are, then uh, I'll explain those over the next few minutes. I'd like to start by just reflecting on what Carbon Tracker and the Grantham Institute had on their minds when we got together just under two years ago. Uh, we had a workshop here at Imperial College and we called it the Disruptive Technical Change Workshop. Um, we were talking about financial stability, we were talking about norms and procedures in energy modelling, um, we were talking about the falling costs of certain technologies, a whole range of issues. But from my perspective at least, it boiled down to one key question, which is, what are these dramatic and sustained reductions in low carbon technology costs going to mean for the global energy system and the different energy resources and energy technologies that feed into that system? So that was in a sense our starting question and the analysis that I'll present follows from that question. So, in a sense, we know now, those of you that are sort of relatively new to the climate and energy agenda know that solar costs are falling very fast, uh, electric vehicles are getting closer to cost um, competitiveness, but it can sometimes be difficult to keep up with these trends, even if you work in the industry and in the analytical space like I and my colleagues do. If you just look at some of the projections of solar photovoltaics that different modeling groups across Europe and, and actually the whole world were making just two or three years ago, this range here in the chart behind me, the, the big orange range is the installed cost of full utility scale solar PV systems in the US, which were assumed across a range of models. You can see there Ampere and Avoid 2. Ampere was a big EU-funded project which was uh, central to the IPCC's fifth assessment report that was released in 2014. And Avoid 2 was the Avoiding Dangerous Climate Change project that um, our institute was involved in for the UK government. So very, very big range of installed system costs going down to something like $1,000 to $3,000 per kilowatt by 2100. And our model, TM Grantham, is the dotted line, and that's sort of towards the lower end, but within the range. So that's a, a century-long forecast of solar photovoltaic costs in the US. If you overlay what's actually happened, <laughs> it's not a mistake. That is actually what's been happening in the US in terms of full installed solar PV costs. So this is our challenge, in a sense, as modelers. How do we keep up with this rapidly uh, changing pace of innovation? I do think that's really confounded expectations. And the key question is, what are the implications of that, and what can we learn from it? No such dramatic chart for electric vehicles, because we don't have so much transparency around what the different modeling groups actually project for those. Um, in our model and in models that we've seen, it's tended to be over the last few years that electric vehicles have reached 
parity, cost parity with internal combustion engine vehicles around the middle of the century, so around 2050. But that's changed a lot in just the last year or two. We've got the Tesla Model 3, which apparently rolls off the production line on Friday, day after tomorrow, so two weeks ahead of schedule. Um, and that's priced at the same sort of range as the BMW 3 Series, which is the car next to it. BMW have come out with this announcement that they will have an all-electric 3 Series um, launched, uh, or at least uh, introduced in September with a 250-mile range. Uh, in the bottom left corner, you've got the Chevrolet Bolt, which is already, of course, on the market and delivering a range in excess of 230 miles. Um, and then in the bottom right corner, you've got possibly, you could say arguably even more um, important and influential than the Tesla is Volkswagen's ID. And this is a key part. Electrification is a key part of VW's post-Dieselgate strategy. The ID is being touted to have a range of between 250 and 370 miles, and that's at the cost of some of the premium VW Golfs, and that's going to be released in the early 2020s. So, in summary, on solar PV, we're something like 80 years ahead of schedule in terms of hitting $1,000 per kilowatt, and in terms of electric cars, we're something like 30 or 40 years ahead of schedule in terms of internal combustion engine cost parity. It's very important that we try to understand the implications of these sorts of analyses. It's also important that we try to understand why these changes have happened. And there have been some commentaries in the press in response to our report around how you don't need expensive subsidies and climate policy because technological change will take care of things itself. The innovation fairy will magically appear and sprinkle her dust and the costs of these technologies will come down. That is not the case. <laughs> PV has gone through a multi-decadal history of policy support, right from the US space program in the 50s and 60s, through the US flat plate array project, through lots of R&D funding, through huge subsidized deployment from German feed-in tariffs, which have been instrumental in incentivizing scale-up of manufacturing in China and other countries. EVs, of course, a lot is owed to Tesla of this phase of EV development uh, and lithium-ion battery costs, but again, there have been tax breaks, incentives, subsidies. So this is not a policy-free story, and let's not make the mistake that there is no role for governments, incentives, and policies in this. That is absolutely central. In terms of what this analysis then shows us, we have a global energy systems model, TM Grantham. We input projections of photovoltaic and electric vehicle costs based on what we think are credible but more rapid cost reductions into the model. And this is what it showed us. In terms of global electricity generation, we see solar photovoltaics growing from a 5% share of generation in 2030, and then really the cost starts to become unstoppable in terms of its reductions, and the economics of PV start to become favorable even against coal, gas, and some other renewable technologies, and it grows to an almost 30% share of electricity generation by 2050. And this is, with some carbon price support, this is in what we deem to be a moderate climate policy scenario, which is, broadly speaking, in uh, the, the sort of range commensurate with countries meeting their 2030 current Paris pledges and then continuing to gradually ramp up their level of ambition beyond 2030. So this is not a strong climate policy case. This is what we believe to be a central policy case at the moment. If you look at what happens to coal and gas as a share of overall electricity generation in our scenarios, we show, therefore, a decimation of those two technologies. And we see that by 2050, coal-fired power generation is all but wiped out, and there is some residual gas-fired generation. But the electricity system globally, even in this moderate policy scenario, is looking very low carbon by the middle of the century. If you look at what happens to the share of electric vehicles in global road transport, considering cars and light duty vehicles only, which is what we did when we first wrote this report, because we thought that heavy freight transport, heavy trucks, were not likely to be electrified anytime soon, 
then you can see that of total road transport, electrification goes from 20% by 2030, and this is of the total vehicle stock, this is not just of new sales, to close to 70% by 2050. But again, it's Tesla again that have announced the semi-truck, um, which is capable of pulling the heaviest loads, which will be introduced at the end of this year. So we've recently, just in the last week, run a scenario which then sees electrification going into heavier road transport sectors as well. And these are the results. You get over an 80% electrification of the total road vehicle fleet by 2050. It's very difficult for people like me, who in some senses are futurologists, to actually keep up with the outturn of what's happening in the market, which should be somewhat embarrassing, but actually something to be uh, quite astonished and, and awed about at the moment. What does this actually mean for fossil fuel demand? So I've compared and contrasted recent projections from three oil and gas majors, Shell, Exxon, and BP, which are unsurprisingly the top three lines. These are indexed global coal demand figures against our scenario, uh, which I've just um, been discussing. And you can see that we're broadly in the same range until about 2030, but then after that, we see this big falling off of coal as coal-fired generation is replaced by solar PV generation in the 2030s. And then if you look at oil, Again, comparing and contrasting our analysis with that of the oil majors, we see, broadly speaking, uh, a similar picture up to 2020, but then we have a plateau, arguably a peak in 2020, and then uh, a sort of increasing rapidity of fall of global oil demand um, after 2030. It's clear that oil demand will, according to our analysis, still be uh, in, in quotes, strong by 2040 because there are a variety of other uses of oil uh, as well as just in road transport, but this is a very, very different picture to what some of the um, other uh, organisations are projecting. And I've put in dotted lines there the additional reduction in oil demand that happens if you get electrification of trucks as well. So those are two high-level results of overall fossil fuel demand. On a less optimistic note, these measures aren't enough, and I think this uh, echoes what Christiana was just saying. Uh, if we have a starting scenario which had our old cost assumptions for photovoltaics and electric vehicles uh, and no climate policy whatsoever, then we were looking at a temperature change of around 4, 4.1 degrees Celsius by 2100. I've worked very closely with climate impacts modelers, and I can tell you that across a range of metrics, that is a nasty, nasty place to be. And if we implement uh, the newer solar photovoltaic and electric vehicle costs and this moderate climate policy in line with the Paris pledges, then we're looking at something like 2.4 to 2.7 degrees Celsius, depending on your probability of, of hitting that temperature uh, range by 2100. So that's good, but also thinking back to the impacts models, that's again not a particularly safe operating space for, for, for the world to be in. So we need to do more. I'd like to finish really by asking those who are involved in making investment decisions, business decisions, policy decisions, to consider why the analysis presented in a report like this might not happen what do you essentially need to believe in order that you think that this isn't a credible analysis? You might think that photovoltaic and electric vehicle cost reductions are going to stop. If you hear about what's happening in the automotive industry globally, I think you'll see that that isn't a credible proposition. If you look at the relentless fall down the cost curve of photovoltaics again, I think that you'll see that there are several years of rapid and sustained cost reductions to be had in photovoltaics. If supporting infrastructure, if grid integration, if electric vehicle charging holds things up, that could happen, but I'm sure that businesses and policymakers will respond to what automakers and what consumers want. And there seems to be a strong appetite now for electric vehicles. There seems to be a lot of penetration of photovoltaics into electricity generation markets, which is changing 
what regulators are thinking about the way that those markets operate and the supporting things like storage that are being implemented. Moderate climate policy disappears, again, as Christiana was saying, referring to, to, to the galvanizing nature of Trump. That doesn't seem particularly credible at this time. And coal power plants and petrol and diesel vehicles costs suddenly start to fall. These are technologies that have had half a century to a century of time to perfect and come down in cost. I don't think it's a credible proposition that we're suddenly going to see them ride down a steep learning curve. So I'd like to finish by saying that there is a particular set of analyses in this report. I hope you all get a chance to read it and, and reflect on it. Um, but I hope you'll share the view of me and colleagues of mine that as the weeks go by, we are constantly surprised at the pace of technological change and constantly challenged to incorporate the implications of that change into our modeling and assumptions. Thank you. Thanks very much, AJ. Um, it just reminds me, actually, uh, that uh, I think when we started discussing this, we had a debate about the meaning of disruption and whether that was a good, good term to use and, and whether we could actually model all forms of disruption anyway, particularly you know, the, the changes in uh, behavior and different types of uh, techn technological application and how they might combine. Um, so hopefully that's a, an area of, of positivity that we can, can still explore. Um, it's great that you managed to achieve time travel in your uh, modeling and, and remove those decades from, uh, from the charts. Um, I think for us, we've certainly uh, had so, some great discussions with some different um, actors who are doing their own sort of modeling, or own, own thinking from, from those sort of brokers in the city who are doing more macro thinking about the energy sector, the auto sector, um, across to you know, the, the big institutions like the IEA, EIA, uh, and I think there's a, a really live debate about the, the assumptions people are using and why those things look different uh, and how they get the, the answers. AJ showed some of the, uh, the, the company projections there. Uh, I think there's you know, a lot of work being done out there, uh, and we can see that it is starting to move. You know, these aren't sort of static uh, reference points now. They're really starting to move, so hopefully that'll, that'll keep going. Um, we've now got a chance to hear from, from some more experts across the, the policy finance technology piece. Um, so I'd be interested to hear what surprises they've seen, uh, what disruption may be coming, uh, and get their reaction to the, the findings so far. Uh, I think we're going to start with uh, Martin Wolf from the Financial Times. Um, so thank you very much for having invited me here. Um, I have no idea why, really, since I claim no great expertise. This is um, how I respond very briefly to what I've heard, and perhaps that will um, sharpen the subsequent discussion. Um, so my first point would be that I have always felt and argued even here in the Grantham lecture I gave quite a few years ago that we will only solve the climate change problem um, the threat if we do it in a way that provides an opportunity for prosperity globally. There was a very um, strong uh, pessimistic view, which I think is diminished, and this report supports that diminution, uh, that the only way to save the planet and ourselves was essentially to give up on the hope of economic development. The implication seemed to be that will be all right because somehow we in the developed countries will preserve our standard of living and everywhere else in the world would forego imitating our standard of living, which struck me as both insane and immoral. So that's crucial. And I argued, and this comes to my second point, that the only possibility for it, therefore, would be some form of technological innovation or innovations that made it possible to achieve both objectives at the same time. And the important point about this report and similar work, which I've been reading in the very recent past, is this looks substantially less implausible than it did a few years ago. 
which is not quite the same thing as saying it's a done deal. I think that's very, very important. Uh, it looked almost impossible uh, 10 years ago, which is why I argued, despite all the fact, and I've argued 10 year, years ago and even five years ago, despite all our talk about this, actually all the trends were getting worse, which is the case. We were, they were all been getting worse. In fact, I think they still are. This leads you to uh, a third question, uh, which has been addressed by the um, Christiana uh, Christina, sorry, and uh, and uh, AJ, is that right? Um, which is, is technology going to solve this problem all on its own? Market forces will deliver. And I think they've already made a very, very clear statement that, that it won't. It won't. Uh, why do we still need very heavy policy intervention and what form might it take? First, we have to shift very quickly, as has been made very clear. We've, we've delayed so long and done so little that we ha now have very little time to make the shift. And that means pretty well restructuring the capital base of the global economic system while it is growing, while it is growing, uh, in very few years. And that has already been mentioned. That doesn't mean just the energy system and the transport system. It means, among other things, the entire urban uh, urban structure of our economy, and this is occurring at a time when the the whole planet is urbanizing. So this is an immense infrastructure investment requirement. Secondly, we still need more technological innovation. We probably won't. It won't be enough to ha to use what we have, though it's immensely helpful. And third, business of itself has massive inertia. And this is true of the financial system, and it's true of all the major players in the system. And changing what they do and how they behave quickly is immensely difficult. Uh, and part of that is, reason for that, is the major systems here are actually surprisingly short term. Their concern about longer term situations is relatively small compared to their immediate situation. And remember, one of the things that makes them for a huge inertia is the massive sunk costs in the system. I mean, th and they're pervasive. There are massive sunk costs in the existing system. So what policies do we need? I still feel we need pricing policies. We need massive interventions through the planning system. Uh, urbanization is, a, apart from the electricity system and transport system, the urbanization of our, of our um, uh, societies is crucial. We need very important developments in regulations, and the crucial area here is the sort of interventions we've begun to see from the Bank of England on risk management in co the corporate sector and particularly in the financial sector, and of course we need so ongoing support for innovation. For that to happen, this gets to my fifth point, we need a continuing and ongoing political pressure. And my sense of it, I'm afraid, is there are quite a number of governments in the Western world, I think it's actually less true in China and India and other developing countries, that have got rather tired of all this and are really not regarding this anymore as the prime focus. And it's not only the US. I think actually it's true of us too. So I think the politics remain very intractable. And I finally want to leave with a question, uh, because I've said enough about what I, I would stress, which is pervasive policy need uh, to shift the system very urgently is required. And this is the a question is this. If you look at the history of the world economy in the last 200 years, it's been driven to a large extent by the nature of energy resources. Industrialization started here because we had coal. And before that, it started in places like this because we had water. Um, then we had oil, which is wonderfully transportable. So that solved, meant that location of activity didn't matter. It seems to me a rather interesting question is whether over the next century, most human beings will end up living where, where there's all th the sun and Europe is a dead continent. <laughs> Thanks very much, Martin. Okay, and now we'll uh, move on to uh, Tassos from uh, GE uh, to hear more about the, well, technology, policy, and finance again. Yes, thank you very much. You know, I'd like to thank everybody for inviting me here today. Um, I 
I'm not going to debate about um, what it, it was just presented because I think we all agree that uh, there are all these disruptions in the marketplace. I think the whole discussion, the whole discussion is about the timing of this, you know, taking place. So depends on how people, what kind of assumptions we'll make. But I'll pick up three or four things to talk about and probably ask some questions as well. Oh, if we look at the, um, in the power sector, you know, the key disruption here is obviously solar and wind and renewables. So if today's cost of, levelized cost of electricity, see that gas is actually the most, the cheapest way or to produce power. Um, solar, utility solar and onshore wind is also, costs have come down and close to parity for gas. So the question then becomes, do we have a visibility about storage to, to be developed in the future so that the cost of utility PV plus the storage will come closer to gas? And while this is going to happen, of course, at some point, this is going to happen, then what happens to gas turbines? Now, obviously, if we look 100 years from now, I'm not in a position to uh, forecast what may happen. But in the next 10 to 20 years, we believe that there is, you know, opportunity for most of the, car of the fuels today. If I give you an example, um, we developed in, in General Electric a turbine HA that delivers 62.3% efficiency. And that was commissioned a year ago in, you know, with one of our customers. But the significant efficiency when you compare to the average efficiency for gas plants in the UK, which I think is less than 50%. So you can see w the, what kind of technological advancements we have also in gas. Nobody doubts that you know, solar is actually a major disruptor. So the relationship is inverse. More solar, less coal, uh, less coal and gas. Amongst the fossil fuels, we believe that clearly gas is the winner for that. So if we take the second point is about the, the question about electric vehicles and oil demand. Um, electric vehicles are, of course, going to, uh, are expected to grow, but there are a number of other segments in the oil de demand that are going to grow, and there is no clear substitutability for those, like petrochemicals, aviation, um, freight, and in some areas, the install base is something that it precludes from this happening, at least in the 10, 20 years. So we, if we, we can take a view of what's going to happen to electric vehicles, and uh, we can model it, and the cost of uh, battery is coming down, as you said earlier on, to parity levels in, in, in ICE, and that will obviously uh, shoot up the demand for electric vehicles, but then we take a more holistic view for the overall system in order to be able to see when the oil demand will peak. Then the, s the last point I'd like to actually talk about is about gas, but LNG from the upstream standpoint or the midstream standpoint. Um, we expect that uh, uh, the midpoint of growth for, for gas is about 1.6 CAGR, and LNG is going to grow 4 to 5 percent. Um, the LNG market is oversubscribed over up to 2024, 2023, and, but to meet the demand for the future, we need to have more LNG. Now, why I'm talking about LNG? Because LNG gives you the ability to make the gas much more global, you know, fuel. It allows the use of gas, you know, in, in different locations, even to transportation. And of course, it allows to connect stranded assets to the demand points. Two weeks ago, I was, in, uh, I was uh, invited to a similar panel in Kazakhstan, and um, the, the Kazakhs produ produce a lot of gas in the Caspian, but most of the demand is in the east and the north. So the question is how you can take the gas, ship it across you know, to, to, the, to the country. So what I wanted to say here is there is going to be a disruption in the market. We all agree and we all see it. But depends, depending on how you respond as a business, then the future of your own business, mm -hmm. is, you know, is dependent on how you respond to the business. So you can make, you know, you can be profitable in a shrinking segment for as long as you have operating, uh, um, um, do things, do things very well, and you have um, um, agile organizations and things like that. So that's how I see it.
Thanks very much, Tassos. And uh, now I'll hand over to uh, Gareth Burns from Statual Energy Ventures. Thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me. As you can tell from my accent, I'm Irish, and uh, one of my surprises is that I'm actually here uh, at this type of an event, as I've worked in the oil and gas industry for uh, most of my career, starting in the downstream uh, segment. Uh, but for the last two years, I've been working on the renewable side uh, of business for Statoil, uh, leading a, uh, what is uh, the uh, largest corporate venture capital uh, fund focused on renewable activities. My background is in investment, and from that perspective, uh, I, I think the one line at uh, Christina used uh, Donald Trump's name earlier on, but m the one line I would like to leave you with is ultimately economics trumps policy every time. And uh, from that perspective, yes, you do need a form of policy, but for investors, if they're not going to be able to get an acceptable, profitable return, they're not going to invest uh, in an opportunity. And that's one of the things we look at as looking at for opportunities to invest in day in, day out. It's can we deliver a profitable return from the opportunity. So then, in terms of some of the other things that we've, we've heard uh, AJ comment upon uh, and, and others, I think one of the reasons we've seen such an acceleration uh, over the last uh, few years is due to the acceleration in technology and particularly digital technology over the, uh, the last 10 years. So 10 years ago uh, this month, the first iPhone uh, was brought out. That has placed so much more power in the hands of the ultimate con consumer. And I think we see that in energy markets as well, that the consumer now has much greater power over how they consume energy. And that uh, transition of power does accelerate, uh, in my view, the transition to a decarbonized uh, economy. Now, Statoil, we, we have uh, grown up on uh, the benefits of oil and gas in Norway. Uh, but we do believe we are in a transition, uh, and as a result, we are working towards participating in that transition because we do believe there will be profitable business opportunities. And if there wasn't that belief, we wouldn't be investing, and I wouldn't be in the role that I'm, uh, I'm in today. In order for the, uh, t uh, us to deliver upon, particularly on the EVs, I think the key element we need to see is ticket price parity because most people do not do an NPV analysis when they go to buy their new car. And until they can see the cost I'm having to pay the car dealer is the same for an electric vehicle over an, uh, an ICE, they're always, most people will choose the cheaper option. And that was one of the, the other uh, sort of comments that I, I want to, to leave with you. In transitions from, uh, t uh, no matter what segment it is, not only does the new product have to be better, but it also has to be cheaper. And depending on your viewpoint, you, uh, you may like to debate what does better mean. But I think most of us uh, would agree what cheaper means. Thanks very much, Gareth. Um, yeah, a few things there just sort of reminded me when we were doing the, the research. Um, you know, we obviously only focused on two very specific technologies of, of solar PV and, and EVs. Um, so there's obviously a whole range of others that sort of remained untouched, as it were. Um, and there are other sectors out there, I think, you know, as part of Mission 2020 that we fed into that there are a range of sectors that need attention and probably the ones that, that we've looked at, there's the most information on, in a sense, certainly power, everyone focuses on power because there are options out there, but then you've got, you know, other sectors in other industries that, um, you know, certainly need more attention. Um, and I think, you know, the, the new revolution going forward perhaps is data, you know, that's that's the new resource that's out there. And 
we can already see people who are using that to come up with much more efficient energy systems. Um, but perhaps go to go back to Christiana, I don't know if you have any responses there in terms of perhaps the, the gas topic or the role of China and India, which certainly we see as a, a differentiator in some of the, the modeling, the assumptions about what's going to happen in, in China and India. Um, yeah, well, I, I gave a few um, data points there, but um, it, it is, it really is remarkable the transition that we're seeing in those um, emerging economies, and, and you could put other perhaps not such stark numbers on the table for other emerging uh, economies, as well as for middle income. So what is happening in middle income countries, certainly the Latin American countries, uh, is, uh, is quite remarkable. I personally am most concerned not about China, India, or Latin American middle income. I'm actually concerned about middle income Asian countries because I think that is where we are really going to have a challenge where they are currently looking very seriously at coal. Um, and if they do move forward with those coal plants, then we have those, uh, those emissions embedded into the, into the structure for 30, 40 years. And the point at which, or the moment at which, they need to make a decision uh, with cost parity, uh, somehow we have to get that to cost parity, is actually right now, because otherwise we will have those emissions for, for several decades. So it is actually those middle income countries in Asia that I am uh, most concerned about, and I think many others as well, um, not necessarily because of gas, but because of coal uh, and the, uh, the added uh, in intensity of, of, um, of carbon in coal. Um, now, have, having said that, I think we're aided very much by the fact that uh, the health impacts of coal are so well known. Uh, we're aided by the fact that uh, the use of water for cooling coal is very well known. We're aided by the fact that we know that there are many different qualities in coal and that each of them has, uh, has a, um, a different impact. So we are aided by, uh, by several factors that help us in this. Um, but to come back to the conversation about policy, we do need both, right? Right now, those policies are not aligned. Um, and because the policies are not aligned, the economy actually is not trumping because you do, you, the economy only trumps when the policy is actually supporting. So if you have a policy that is working in a different direction, then obviously if, if you're competing against, I don't know, fossil fuel subsidies, then that's very difficult. So, so for me, you know, the, if you have an equal playing field, a completely equal playing field, then I would agree. Uh, that price uh, definitely trumps policy, but that is not usually the case. You, you do have that interplay between policy um, and price. Um, and just to the, the, the other point that I just wanted to quickly react to uh, is uh, to, to the point um, that both of you made there at the end about which companies are actually going to be winners here. And I think I deduce the conclusion from both of you um, that there is a growing realization, fortunately, that there are no predetermined winners or losers in this, in this transition. Um, that you are a loser only if you, as a company, decide that you do not want to move forward with the new technologies. But both of you have very clearly put forward your cases where you are really moving forward with, uh, with new technologies for this century. And hen hence, you can determine as a corporation that you are going to be a winner here. And I think that's important because I do not participate either in blaming any sector or country or corporation, nor do I participate in saying, okay, this, there's a predetermined win and a predetermined lose. Frankly, you know, we all take responsibility and we can all determine whether, you know, we, we move forward and take advantage of the economic opportunities and of the profits that come with, uh, with these century technologies. And AJ, was there anything else that you think's come out, you know, since we did the study that you need looking at now? What's the latest surprise? I mean, one thing that we looked at since the study is whether U.S. withdrawal from Paris would have much of a, an impact on this story. And the answer is no. Um, the PV 
penetration figures look very, very similar, even with much weaker climate policy in the US at a global level. Um, and that's not accounting for the fact that the, the US as a whole, or, or, or one small sort of, albeit ruling cohort of the US says they're out, but, but most of, much of the US in terms of states and cities still says that they're in. So that's one sort of change, big change, that, that we've considered, but we don't think that really changes the story. Um, it's worth very quickly responding to some of the comments made about assumptions around um, cost parity and so forth. Just to clarify, our study does assume ticket cost parity mm -hmm. of electric vehicles with internal combustion engine vehicles by the early 2020s. We do take into account the additional storage and balancing costs needed to accommodate an increase in penetration of solar PV and intermittent renewables into the grid. Our model does incorporate the global demand for oil from petrochemical for petrochemical products for aviation and so on. And so those charts I showed you is global demand for oil, considering those other sectors which do continue to demand oil. And yet we still see this quite big growing gap between our projections and those of, of some of the other majors. And that's no small thing. You know, we're seeing gaps of two or three million barrels of oil per day by the mid-2020s and 25 million barrels per day by 2050. It was something of the order of two, I think, isn't it, James, that was um, uh, the, the supply-demand imbalance during the recent oil price crash. So the, these are not marginal effects. Uh, and gas, we agree, I think, with, with Tassos actually has a a quite strong future in terms of the next couple of decades, but is very much a transition fuel, lower carbon intensity, fine for transition from dirtier coal um, to gas, but then as you get into the mid-century and the need to decarbonise further, you will see two degrees and well below two degrees scenarios, which we haven't run here, which see all fossil fuels going, going down very, very significantly. So um, those are some sort of reflections on what's happened since the study and responses to some of the comments made. Carol? Yeah, I've, I have a couple of responses to that. Uh, first of all, I, I, I agree, yes, we are going to we are going to see a change uh, and an increasing sort of penetration of electric vehicles into the sort of global carpool. Uh, We've invested in a uh, car, an electric vehicle charging infrastructure company precisely because of that, because we uh, we want to get a, a better understanding of it and, and we also believe we'll get a good return on it. Uh, however, I I'm, I'm not sure it will continue to grow as quickly as we're predicting and I don't think it will accelerate. And the reason I have for that belief is uh, well, maybe let's do a, p a poll of the audience. Sort of, how many people are car owners? Okay. So, how many of you change your car as often as you change your phone? Okay. So, when you buy a car, you tend to own it for a few years. So, I think. Uh, because of that, it is going to take time for the, uh, the makeup of the, the carpool to change. And so then it, new cars continue to be bought today, which are ICEs, which will still be on the road in 15, 20 years. So I think you, you'll potentially see the, uh, t those who are keen to drive an electric vehicle buy them first, and then over time, gradually, it'll, it'll change. But it may not be as, as quick. But I do believe it... it Sort of out, sort of the. It's probably more 2030s, 2040s. We'll see that uh, change coming. Whether that's quick enough for what uh, for the uh, sort of climate issues we face is a a, a separate matter. Yeah. But I do agree with you, though, in terms of the impact on uh, in terms of the Paris Agreement. Uh, in the US, virtually all of the regulations are set at a state level. So, uh, and there are more jobs in the renewable sector than there are in coal. Can, can I do a sub question to the one that you asked about how many people own cars? Um, how many people under 30 own a car? <laughs> how many people under 30 are there? Yeah, how many people under 30 are there? <laughs> <laughs> many more. Okay, this is my point, right? Ownership of cars is also diminishing quite mm -hmm. rapidly, particularly in that, in that generation. 
A, because, you know, there's, there's shared economy, there is, you know, all of these other. So that w the, the paradigm of transportation that we have, that I grew up with, that you can only transport yourself if you own four wheels, is completely gone, right? We are moving from, in, in mobility, we are moving very quickly from a good or a physical asset to the service of mobility. And that is a huge revolution. <laughs> that is goes beyond electric uh, vehicles. That goes into the sharing economy. That goes into automation of vehicles. And a whole, you know, those are the three revolutions that are, on, that are um, going on at the same time. Um, uh, and, you know, of course, the huge discussion there is what does that do to jobs, obviously. Um, but we're not discussing that here. But I do think that, uh, that ownership of vehicles is clearly on the decline. Yes, I totally and not just in the, in, in the industrial countries, by the way. Not just. Can I have a question on that? Has anyone overlaid the sociological changes with the technological changes? Because that would be really fascinating. Yeah, that would be very fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I think that obviously the, a lot of the growth that's in, in some of the models is in places that don't have huge car fleets, so you're not actually replacing the fleet. It's what is their first choice in China, for example. Um, and maybe I should correct my answer, I lease a car, so I do actually change it more often than 15 years. So um, That doesn't matter if they somebody else buys it. It's a question of the well, life of the car. it's an electric one anyway, so it's fine. Uh, but, but, um, uh, you had another comment, Martin. Yeah, I have two comments, which... So far, we've had a fair amount of agreement, so I think violent disagreement is necessary, otherwise it's very <laughs> boring. Um, so the first point, and they're basically related, Gareth was very valuable because he, he really provoked me. So the, um, uh, the uh, first point comes, he was talking about uh, um, system, he was basically talking about the inertia in the system. and and was the central point I made. There is enormous inertia in the system. There are enormous sunk costs in the system. We can give you many examples. In the financial system, the oil and, oil and, uh, oil and gas industry, in the electric utility industry, and of course in governments. Uh, so that has to be shifted. But to, on his specific example, so there's inertia in the fleet because the fleet uh, uh, has a life um, varies on uh, um, what the average life is, but uh, it clearly has a life. But of course, and this links to my second point, policy can change that. The rate at which you scrap cars is policy determined. I, I can give you a, several different alternatives which would accelerate scrapping like mad. Now they might create political difficulties, but I can get rid of the internal combustion engine fleet very quickly if I want to. Uh, and. Uh, and as, if a government has a credible alternative and wants to promote the production of electric EV industry, e, uh, elect, uh, electric vehicles quickly, um, it would have a very strong incentive to do so, and I expect it to happen. And this links to the, the and I want to underline this. I disagree very profoundly with the statement that economics trumps policy. It's a m misstatement of the situation. Economics and policy co-evolve. And uh, I can give you infinite examples on this, but I'll just focus on a rather important and intriguing example which is relevant to this discussion. Um, you probably all know, and probably anyone who's ever lived, visited America is aware, that the fuel efficiency of the European vehicle fleet is very substantially greater than the fuel efficiency of the American vehicle fleet. This is not because of prime economics unaffected by policy. The reason for this difference is that we in Europe tax fuel very, very heavily, and in America they don't. And if you make that decision, consumers rationally choose uh, a different sort of vehicle, one that is more fuel efficient. Another example, and this is my last example on this, is when, we dis when people decided, in basically in the 80s, I think, uh, in America and then elsewhere on clean air from power stations, this was not an economic decision. The power stations didn't want to do it. They wanted to belch smoke because it was cheaper. They were told they couldn't, so they stopped, more or less. And technology was developed, of course, with some help, but basically developed to achieve that aim. It was the result of a policy decision. Policy shapes economics. It has always shaped economics. Policy will determine the, what our cities look like, and that will determine how fuel efficient the cities will be. 
So I don't regard these as separate things. And at the moment, because of the inertia problem, policy has to be very, very, very aggressive. Okay. Uh, I can see that the audience is keen to ask questions. Was it quick, Tassos? Or? Yes, a very good thing. Is I think we, we talked about a number of disruptions, but we never talked about digital and what digital can do to all this. Very and, cool. and that's very important because um, we believe that when you have an install base, meaning units, that they are actually generating power or um, producing um, oil and gas, then you can add sensors read data and help the customer generate more value. And I think this is an area where you improve preventative maintenance, you can, in, you can predict failure, you can improve the asset, of, you, you can have asset optimization and you effectively you give value to the customer, which is a service, digital is becoming a service enablement. So instead of selling more equipment, you start selling more solutions and digital is key to that, whether it's solar, uh, gas, uh, uh, LNG, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, um, I'll stop here. Okay. So now we're uh, ready to take some questions from the audience. If uh, we've got some hiding, I think there's some microphones hiding as well. <laughs> uh, I was wondering uh, in your analysis, I think it's uh, also a lot of other technolo uh, technological changes going on. For example, 3D printing, you have, um, um, you have car sharing, and uh, very soon you have cars without any driver at all. I must uh, must admit I didn't raise my hand, and I can't even bother to buy a car, because I think you know that um, self-driving cars will actually come very very soon. Uh, so I was wondering if you have calculated that into your forecast as well, because uh, I'm an oil, oil analyst, and I actually think that the oil demand will fall much faster than uh, you indicate here. And uh, another question as well uh, is that Blu uh, Michael Bloomberg and his team, they, uh, they uh, uh, had a report out last week uh, where you start to price in uh, climate risk. And uh, I think you know, that could help, uh, for, uh, for example, for the financial industry because we've been a bit below the surface. Um, how do you see that um, these kind of climate uh, reporting or at least uh, climate risk starting to be priced into the market could change also or get to a fast change in the financial industry. And uh, do you think that um, some, or, or we could see in the future that also the lenders of money could be, be starting to have to pay for, or if you have to uh, start paying for the uh, lending you do to, uh, to your organization, organizations actually polluting more? Do you think that you could start to, to sue them as well, not only the, the actually producer of the um, emissions? Thank you. Do you want to take the first? Thing? Yeah, thanks. I'll just take that first one briefly. The, the sort of specific answer to the question around car sharing and what downward pressure that could have on oil demand is no, we didn't look at that. We kept quite narrowly focused on uh, technological changes to service quite conventional projections of energy demand. So um, I agree that there are, there are many other forces at play that we're not presenting in the analysis. The more general sort of answer to that is that as an energy modeler who um, produces projections all the way out to 2050 or 2100, um, one has to accept quite often that the scenario scenarios produced will not bear that much relation to reality because there will be so many different changes happening in a few decades time that we just don't know about at the moment. So these are quite constrained scenarios and they show what would happen under quite specific controlled circumstances. But I think that there is a, I hope that there is a sort of phase of innovation now that's, that's being unleashed not just in the world of bits but in atoms and molecules that will help to address many of these stickier sectors that we're not seeing decarbonize as fast, like heavy industry, for example, which Christiana uh, uh, mentioned. And that could also be through things like behavior change, through recycling, through reduced material use in, in products and so forth. Um, I mean, on the second one, we just produced an analysis, two degrees of separation, which showed how you could apply a two degree scenario uh, to the oil and gas sector and what that would mean for supply uh, projects. So I think we're certainly 
think it's possible for the companies to start providing more information, but I don't know if there's any more views from... Uh, well, just very briefly, the task force that I mentioned, I think, is, is what you're referring to. So it's the um, task force that was started by Mark Carney and now being headed by Mike Bloomberg. Um, it's the task force on financial disclosure that was started by the Stability Board, by the Global Stability Board. Why? Because the Global Stability Board understands that high carbon is a huge risk and a threat to the global economy. That's why they started this process. And we're now into year two or three of this um, task force with, um, and, and it was uh, mandated by the G20, hence it reports back to the G20 this week. Um, and, and, and basically, you know, what the task force is saying is, look, there are three steps here. Number one, measure. What is your risk exposure to carbon, high carbon assets um, in your portfolio, in your company, and in your case, in your investment for, or lending portfolio? Number two, report it. Be very clear about it. And number three, take decisions. So that is the process. Measure, report, and take decisions. And many companies are already at step number three. Um, and those who are not at step number three maybe should hurry up, because otherwise, <laughs> your assets will be very quickly losing value. Uh, another question. Thank you. My name's switched on. Um, Becky Moorhood from the Base Select Committee at the House of Commons. And I've also got two questions. Um, firstly, do you think that the current lack of policy support for at least large-scale solar and onshore wind in the UK is really a barrier to deployment, given that the costs are coming down so quickly? And secondly, um, policymakers are often criticised for being rather behind the curve on technology and market developments. And AJ, you said yourself that you find it quite hard to keep up with them. Um, have you got any views on how policy could be best designed to be more flexible and adaptable to unforeseen changes such as these? Um, any takers? Two quite difficult questions, actually. I think um, <laughs> on the first question around changes to support for solar PV, I, I suspect that will do the, the, the government more damage than it will do for the long-term prospects of, of solar PV. Um, it's been damaging in terms of expectations, in terms of employment, in terms of companies that have got into this sector. Um, but I think that the, 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 the dynamics of cost reduction of PV are a quite global phenomenon at the moment, and there is policy support elsewhere that are helping to drive down those costs. So I think that it might be a blip rather than a sort of um, a, a wall that PV is going to hit. Um, in terms of the flexibility of policy question, that's enormously difficult. I think that as a general point, um, it's important that many policy makers and modeling groups and modeling teams, for example, within Bayes, undertake scenario analyses like the one that we've done here, because there are hundreds, if not thousands, of technologies that go into energy system models like, like the one that, that I and, and, and my colleagues run, and it's very data intensive. It takes a lot of time to update those um, cost assumptions, but it's very important that it's done, because changes are happening so rapidly. So it's not really an answer about what policy should do, but certainly I think it's imperative at the moment that a number of different scenarios are explored and policies are cognizant of the, 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 the possibilities that, that we're now seeing. Gareth's going to help you out. Yeah, I'm just comment on the uh, t your, your question about lacking policy support. From an investment perspective, sort of what's important for us is stability. So we know what environment we are investing. I think there are, while I made the comment, the slightly provocative comment earlier about uh, economics trumping policy, yes, there is a need to have some policy to get things going. But once you have got to a certain stage where you are on a level playing field, then economics will take off. When, when I started in the renewable business two years ago, we were predicting uh, subsidy-free offshore wind in sort of five, ten years. And we've had auctions this year which have been virtually subsidy-free. Uh, now, that is because of the advances in technology and because of the competitive nature of the business that costs are being uh, driven down. 
what is going to be very damaging to it is if the policy keeps changing back and forth. Uh, and I would just uh, appeal to, uh, to to governments if you can if you put a policy in place, be clear. This is the policy that is going to be in place, and it's going to be in place under these economic conditions for this period of time and then businesses will plan on the basis of that stability and will invest on the basis of the ability to get a profitable return. Okay, that's a good question. Because it sort of follows from what I said at the end and I think it fits in with this, which is can you discuss how solar energy can be tradable? The, the point is obvious, isn't it? It's location specific. So how do you move the relevant energy around the globe? Do you mean tradable or transportable? Transportable. When there are borders, it's the same thing. Maybe we'll think about that one. Uh, we had another question at the back, I think. Or is one in the middle with the microphone? Yeah. Um, yes, and then it's transportable. Self first. Very nice. Um, hi, I'm Orvin Thurston, Divest Merton. Um, question really on kind of civil society and disruption and activism. Uh, from that sector in its various forms, principally for Christiana, I guess Martin, and possibly James. Um, you know, disruption in markets takes many forms. Um, Martin particularly was making the point about the huge necessity for to activate forces to overcome inertia in systems. Um, what does the panel think that the role is for civil activism in its various forms, non-violent, of course, all the way from, um, you know, share activism, um, various forms of um, uh, uh, divestment, uh, et cetera, around institutions. Um, what, what is the role of that? Is that hopelessly kind of uh, Western European and American centric? You, uh, Christiana mentioned her, her fears for kind of middle tier Asian uh, communities, um, uh, in, in nations, economies, what is the role and relevance of, th of the various forms of civil society activism? That's interesting. I mean, I'll, I'll take that one if you want. Um, I mean, I think for us, we see it as a, a range of um, activities going on. It's certainly been very helpful in putting on on the agenda of a lot of financial institutions. So putting it on the agenda of the the committees of pension funds to see if they've actually got a, an answer, a good answer about how they manage climate risk. And if not, they need to go and find one or ask their fund manager how they're doing that. Um, and that's, you know, stimulated a lot of questions of the companies through resolutions. So being more active shareholders, you know, certainly, again, puts it on the agenda of the companies. So we've seen a much more public debate around how companies, you know, are resilient to a, a lower carbon scenario or not as a result. I think there's a wide range of um, consumer behavior that is actually very helpful, and it goes everywhere from taking to the streets. You know, the 2014 march in New York was incredibly helpful, um, as as have been you know every other march since then. So you go from there to the pressure to divest and invest. Uh, you go to frankly everything that we purchase. Uh, consumer behavior, where you know where our wallet uh, is is uh, taking a void vote on products that we consume, or how we transport ourselves, how we vote. Uh, I mean, the the fact you know the the myth that the individual is powerless in the face of climate change is a total myth, because we do have as individuals we have an incredible amount of power as political beings, as economic beings, as social beings, and we, there is a, as all those three, there's a wide range that we can use, and we should, and we should, um, because as I say, you know, we are definitely running out of time, and all pressure being, uh, being brought to bear is actually quite helpful. But Martin seemed to be implying that that impetus was running down, certainly in terms of the response of, of governments. I, it is my perception that, um, well, we know what's happened in the US, it's pretty clear, but my perception is that in a rather more genteel British way, exactly the same thing is effectively happening. Uh, I would be happy to be told that I'm wrong, but my impression was that in the coalition, because of certain individuals, there was a relatively high 
um, political weight placed on dealing with these challenges, at least at the rhetorical level, and I think more than rhetorical level. And uh, since uh, 2015, that has diminished substantially. And since we've got ourselves into a not inconsiderable mess over our relations with Europe, I think that's the most gentle way I can put it, uh, the priority has fallen further. So I would say that at the policy level, I would be happy to be told I'm wrong, I haven't followed it so closely in the last year, but the British government is more or less absent without leave. Okay. And one quick one at the back. Yeah, a question for the panel. Dylan Tanner from Infl Influence Map. Um, what are your thoughts on the market synergies between renewable energy and EVs? Um, for example, uh, storage and plug-in cars. Uh, Tesla sees it as the core of their business model and they're combining it, but Japan yeah. sees a world where increasing coal, clean coal, will power their increasing EV fleets, and they don't seem to latch onto those synergies. What are they missing out on? Well, clearly. I mean, a quick answer on this one. I would expect that um, you know there is a synergy, and um, the the EVs could offer if there is a demand side, you know, uh, DSM demand side management, then there is a, 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 the possibility to have energy going f both ways. Yep. Therefore, that you can actually take um, surplus production of energy coming from renewables and store it into 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 uh, into EVs but then you need to have the right the right pricing policy and also EVs could offer the opportunity to uh, um, to to effectively peak shave to, to be a peak shaver right so you can actually move the peaks down to a base load for uh, for, for in the in the power system i think the EVs have got potentially i do not know when the oppor the, the ability to play a stabilization system in the grid uh, and that means interaction between EVs, digital and renewables. Yeah. That's the way I see it. Absolutely. Could I just quickly add to that? I mean, um, I had a chat with an investment firm a couple of weeks ago and they said that we were assuming far too much grid storage in our scenarios. They are actively not going to invest in grid storage in the UK because they think the EVs will totally take care of it. Okay. Could we uh, have a quick round of applause for our panel, please? James, sorry, I have two invitations. Mm -hmm. Other than drinks, before okay. the drinks. In indeed. So I have two invitations. I got a little bit nervous when, Mar Martin, you intimated that everybody would now come to the tropics and abandon Europe. Coming from the tropical country of Costa Rica, I got really nervous. But I have actually changed my mind on that and would like to make a very uh, open engagement and uh, invitation that you are more than welcome to come, despite the fact that I think Europe will have plenty of renewable energy. You're more than help, uh, welcome to come as long as you respect our biodiversity, which is our army, um, and bring your brains with you, which we need. Um, and my my second invitation goes to my wonderful friends, the organizers of this event, Grantham and Carbon Tracker, for the next time to uh, strive and actually achieve better gender balance on the panel. Yes. Come with that to another white male. Um, I'm just a just about to make the gender balance worse. So I'm Mark Campanelli from the Carbon Tracker Initiative just to wind up with a few observations. Firstly, to thank our, our generous host, uh, Grantham, for putting on this uh, event with us. Um, and also for the drinks, which are gonna be in the courtyard at the back, is, you call it the back outside? Opposite the Grantham Institute. Opposite the Grantham Institute, which everyone is welcome to. So what, what do we just hear? And I'm not gonna repeat what was discussed, but there seems to be t sort of t two things that came out which are worth as a takeaway, the first one is the, the speed and the scale of the transition. I think all the evidence and the discussion really points us to the speed and the scale of the transition. Now, why do I think that is important? When we set up Carbon Tracker, it was to test the science of carbon budgets against the plans of the fossil fuel majors. That's what we were doing. And the plans of the fossil fuel majors was to get more out um, and to get bigger. And they're still planning um, an expectation that we'll be using a lot more fossil fuels. We've got to remember a lot of the outlooks that are used still forecast and predict a lot more fossil fuel use. And I think it was the IEA last year that forecast there will be tens of trillions will be invested in the fossil fuel economy over the next couple of decades. 
Now, um, could they be wrong? Now, one of the highlights for me in the year, this year uh, was Santos, one of the Australian oil and gas companies, saying that a four degree scenario was reasonable for shareholders. Um, <laughs> now, if you don't remember that, look, Google it up, Santos, four degrees. It would create value for shareholders. And um, that was one of the early responses to a two degree stress test. Um, and now, when every, if every major fossil fuel company was to come out with a similar scenario, a four degree scenario saying this is reasonable for shareholders, you can quickly see how many financial and institutions will have to probably start to challenge company boards with uh, how they use shareholder funds because there's no scenario I see where four degrees can create value for anybody, least of all the shareholders of a company. And if that's the level of understanding that the, the chief executives of corporations have about the challenges we face, I mean, that they're going to be disappointed because I think the city is going to withdraw their support. When I say the city, I mean the global financial institutions. And obviously, the Exxon vote was pivotal in bringing a lot of big institutions over the line, saying that this is very serious indeed. Now, the second point that I heard um, really was the importance of economic prosperity, but also the challenge of inertia, that it's important to create wealth in this transition. I think the, the evidence of the, of the electrification and... Uh, the new innovation and, and so on does support the case for prosperity, but the problems with inertia means are we going to come too late? And that's where I want to conclude is the importance of policy. What we heard the panel say very, very conclusively is policy absolutely is vital and it's important that governments step up to the plate. But what we learned from Carbon Tracker is that financial actors can also be an influence on government policy. And this was probably why uh, the Paris Agreement, backed by big financial institutions, was, was really important because the investment community turned up in force in Paris to support an outcome. And that's the reason why I have great confidence for the future that we're winning the financial arguments as well as what you might call the moral arguments. Thank you very much for coming this evening.